I'll kind of explain how we first met. Um, obviously, got a me I, I had a message from a guy called Sand Oil. I had no idea because I don't follow league. I have no until I met Shandor, I never followed league. I'm an AFL guy. I first got a message from Sandor. Um, I heard from, I uh, asked a guy who works in the NRL team, Sydney Roosters. He's a strength coach. He's my mate. And I said, who's this guy, Shandor? And he said, Look, listen, he's coming back from a van. I reckon it'd be great if you took him on, if he wants to come down. We obviously first met. I heard his story. He's explained it to me. And that's obviously kind of how we first met in terms of started training him. So um, I think that my thing, my experience with Shandor so far, and especially rugby league in general, is kind of the preparation and the athlete development, isn't it kind of like the standard that I thought it would be at? Um, I don't think, you know, especially you when you first came down to Woodford, I thought you'd be um, more advanced in the fundamentals in terms of the basics. And we kind of had to break you down as much as possible and start you at like kind of level one. So, Jace, I'm guessing you explained them the importance of understanding the fundamentals of just learning how to hinge, learning how to squat, horizontal push, pull and all that stuff. So I think that's, that's a big takeaway that kind of I've learned with Shannon. Regardless of the level you're at, even if you're at the, the pro level, which he's at now, um, and he was at before, is just nailing as much as possible the basics and the fundamentals, which is so important because it's going to last you your whole career. And that's what's kind of the core of your program. So I think that was the biggest thing that I've kind of found with Shandor was kind of when he came down, was breaking him down as much as possible and just getting the basics right. Do you guys have any questions? I don't know how we're going to do this. So I just kind of just started with throw it open. Is there any questions specifically you want us to go over? It might be something to do with Shandor's career. It might be something to do with how I like things done or his programming or anything at all. You could ask us anything. We'll throw it open the floor. You guys can ask us questions. Oh, I've got maybe one and yep. maybe for you, Sandor. Yep. Um, so some of these boys have just been picked for an NRL train-on squad, so a little bit Harold, like Harold Matz, yep. that sort of stuff. So some of them are fairly new. Some of them have been in the program for a little little while. Like, so how much you know, effort, training, dedication, all that sort of stuff do these boys really need to, to, to embrace and take on? Yeah, I suppose I'll just give you a bit of a rundown. Um, when I was thinking about coming here today, I was sort of thinking, you know, what, what do I want sort of my first time post everything that's gone on, now looking to return back to rugby league, like what sort of message do I want to bring across? Um, as sort of an older guy, the last time I was playing footy, I was 22, 23. Didn't really get many opportunities to speak to younger kids, but now it's like, I want to sort of explain my story as a bit of an underdog story, like, and this is the reality of most NRL players. It's not, um, you're not talented at 14, 15, and then you just make it in the NRL and everything's rosy. All the best guys you follow and aspire to be, they all went through a really hard road. You know, they didn't just walk into an NRL team just because they were super talented. And that's the reality you guys face now. There's some really quality kids, whether you're 16, 18, playing school. And the expectation is that these guys are just gonna make it into the NRL. But, you know, that's not always the reality. And the path I took was quite hard. You know, I was amongst, I was just chatting to the guys there. I was amongst the school team, um, Matchville Sports High. And we had, you know, littered with first graders and we, we won the comp. But once that school year was over, it meant nothing. You know what I mean? I went into the 20 system and the reality is no one really cared about what I'd done at school. And there was a lot of hard work in front of me. And that's sort of always what I've built everything on. I just wanted to be the hardest worker in the room, regardless of how talented you were. Or sometimes the struggle was real. I was in Harold Matson SG Ball and you've got kids being flown down. They're on contracts and... You know, I, I can remember being told time and time again, being in a meeting saying, oh, you know, maybe one or two of you will play first grade. And I sort of always laughed at that, knowing that, you know, I'd played rugby league since I was four. There's no way that some guy who works for the club is going to tell me that I'm not going to make it. So I always had that belief in myself. But from a young age, 16 is sort of where it started. Harold Matz is your first opportunity to be like, all right, this is what it's going to be to play professionally. This is the training it's going to take. And I just made a commitment, you know, you guys have now made the decision that maybe NRL or rugby league is what you want to do professionally. So you need to start building your life around that and saying, maybe there are some choices, some sacrifices I need to make, whether it's uh, skipping some of mum's food and focusing on good nutrition or not going out on the weekends. And it's like, I need to start making these right choices if I truly want to be you know, a rugby league player. So that's where I was at. I just sort of thought, um, if I'm going to play rugby league and that's who I want to be, then I'm going to do everything in my life to make sure that happens. So I guess um, that's what I built things around. And it wasn't an easy road, you know. Like I said, we had some, I had some good success at school. We had a great team. And then um, when I started playing, it was the start of the under-20s comp, which I think is gone now, but it was a great stepping stone. And um, I was lucky enough to debut, but 
I'll give you a little rundown just to show you how, you know, the highs and lows, I guess. Once I debuted at, at, in the Roosters, the team I'd supported my whole life, which is an awesome opportunity. Sort of got in a bit of trouble at a nightclub uh, <laughs> after my debut, which is, you know, the reality. Ended up being everything okay, but unfortunately I wasn't given a contract. So, you know, I'm 19, I just played first grade, thinking, oh, sweet, everything's going to be okay. And then all of a sudden I don't have a contract. So I go into pre-season and ended up just having to train by myself. Uh, that next year I got an opportunity at Penrith. Luckily, Brad Fitler, who was my coach then, got me a meeting at Penrith. And I remember meeting, you guys might not know him, he's a coach called Matt Elliott. And he sat me down in the room and he had a whiteboard just here and he had 12 names on it, I think. And he said, you're at the bottom. We'll give you a chance. You can play in the reserve grade team, um, see how you go. And I, was, and I just thought to myself, well, if I, I know if I play each week better than these guys, I'm gonna get a crack. So I went away, started playing in the reserve grade team. Two weeks later, I got a contract and then by round 16 or 17, I debuted. So I guess, you know, I'll give you a couple more stories like that, but the, the message I'm trying to send is at the end of adversity, you know, it's highs and lows for me, but at the end of adversity, something always great had come from it, but that's only because I didn't give up or I didn't think about the worst possible situation. I always looked at the positives. You know, I rocked up there with barely an opportunity, no money. You know, there was, there was nothing really going on, but I thought I'm gonna make the most of this and I'm gonna make sure I'm the best player on the field each week. And of course, that's gonna to lead to something positive. I think if you can focus on, um, the reality is we're all gonna make mistakes. You're gonna have a shit game. You're gonna do something stupid. You know, if you can understand that part of the, the journey to where you wanna be is gonna be up and down and you're gonna fail, you're gonna make mistakes. If you can accept that that's just gonna happen and understand that when it does, you're gonna get through it, I think you'll be sweet. It's the guys who, can't handle that adversity, can't handle when things go wrong and are probably expecting everything to just be perfect. So when you do get injured or when you don't make a team and you just, everything, every, your world's over, but that's not the reality. If you can get through that, I truly believe there's something always on the other end. Following that, you know, we made the finals. I had an amazing year, got a couple of cool highlights. That's great. And then um, I was injured, unfortunately. I had double shoulder reconstruction. So again, I was faced with, uh, you know, nine months off the field and that was another tough time. It's like, Yet, like I said, you go down through the heart, you come up and play some awesome footy and then something like that happens. And you're faced with that reality again, like, oh, you know, here we go. Um, I come back from that and was given an opportunity at the Raiders. And then there you go again, I come out of that nine months of having off and um, we ended up going from 13 to six. Had some awesome football play with, my centre player was uh, Blake Ferguson then. And I think we scored something like 30 tries in 15 games. And again, there we go, we just had a, another massive year and then unfortunately I was faced with a suspension. Uh, I can touch on that if you guys want to know more about it, but yeah, I was faced with that suspension, I guess. There's another one where we just went up and down again. And now I'm here after training uh, for four years and sort of learning that there's a little bit more to life than football and going out and doing some things, you know, I was sort of in that bubble and that's another thing you guys need to focus on. If, if I was sitting in your shoes, it wouldn't have matter who came up and spoke to me, it wouldn't have matter how much I idolise them, it's just the cliche of like, you know, how important school is, how important this and that is. And at the, the, fa the fact is it doesn't mean much sitting there now, but um, the reality is once you step outside of school, the, the coaches, the guys that look after you, they're not gonna be there, you're on your own, you know what I mean? So all I would say is take advantage of being in the school system. I'm not saying we're all gonna go to university and get degrees and all the rest of it. And I'm not gonna say football's gonna work out, but take advantage of the time you have now, all this help, all this assistance, because that's not gonna happen when you leave school. And the same thing is, if you make football, you're gonna get a lot of help, you're gonna get a lot of assistance, but that's not always gonna be there. So, like I said, we're not gonna be doctors, you don't have to, but find something you're passionate about. So you can have something off the field that you enjoy, that you care about, and then you can also have football that you can chase as a career. So make sure you have that balance. And um, yeah, I guess if there, are, if there are any questions, I'm happy to help out and give you any training. You know, I'd love, I would have loved to, the position I'm in, I'm big on my training, big on, you know, putting the full picture together to be the best player I can be. So if there's any questions, whether it's training, how should I do this, what should I do, any tips, I'd love to help you guys out. And um, yeah, I appreciate you let, giving me the chance to talk to you. I think the, the one thing that all you guys can take away, not just from football, but the fact that he, you know, I think that one thing I got from you when I first met you was just your mindset. Like you can tell, you, you know, like, like me and I've told you, I was very immature back in the day, but if, if you can explain the boys, and because I'll be honest with you, I've learned a lot from you, like um, in terms of business and just life in general. And I think we've kind of, I've grown since you've been at Woodford's. But can you talk to the boys about your mindset after um, you got suspended? Talk about your mindset, how you felt and why you went away to Thailand and 
um, and what you did in Thailand, how you, how you kind of got away from, you talk about the bubble, can you explain to the boys about how you got away from that bubble and how that helped you grow and develop as a person? You obviously met your missus, um, Steph, and how they helped you grow. Yeah, I guess, um, and that comes back to like, I don't want to sugarcoat everything. I'd rather like tell you guys the reality of how it is because I'm sure if you speak to, if speak to any footy players or anything like that, you're going to get that average story and it's going to be all fairy tale. And that, I'd rather give you the reality and then you guys be able to go, you know what, I'm going to really knuckle down here. I'm going to focus on that. But obviously when everything happened, I was suspended. There's a lot of scrutiny, you know. Uh, I remember being on the... I think I was on the plane trip because I wanted to get away to Thailand. I've been over there with a few of the boys to train. I remember being on the plane and, you know, the guy opened up the paper next to me and I was all over it with all the, you know, normal shit that you'd hear about it. And, you know, it was, it was daunting. It was everyone, it was, everyone was bagging me out. Everyone was ripping into me. And that's, that's the nature of the beast. I accept that. But I thought I'm just going to get away and put my mind into something. I could have easily put my head down and, you know, probably gone down the route of depression and let things really get to me. But I thought I'm going to get into something, um, you know, as we all are, we all play sports, so we're all competitive. So I thought maybe business is the way to do it. So I went over to Thailand, opened a little cafe and a gym. And before you knew it, I, I'd found my passion outside of football. When I say bubble, I mean all your friends are rugby league players. Um, you know, all you do is focus on footy. And of course, you think that everything's going to be okay and everything's sweet. But the reality is, is you're only an injury away or something happening. And that's, that's the unfortunate things that can happen. So I guess... Um, you know, I used to look back at my time and think, what did I really do? I think most of us would watch movies, play PlayStation, go to cafes, and we're playing first grade, you know, and that's all we're doing with our life. So that's what I mean about trying to create a little bit more for yourself, not have everything depend on football. Because I guess once I hit 22, 23, and, um, you know, I was, I was so worried about my next contract, and it was so much pressure, you sort of lose the enjoyment for footy a little bit, and you don't want to lose that. You want to be playing every game and going to training excited to be there, because if you do lose that, starts to get, you know, it, it starts, can start to get a bit hard. So I guess getting away to Thailand and um, just keeping my head up and always knowing that that's not the way I wanted to end things in footy. So uh, yeah, getting into some business stuff, being able to take on those opportunities, meet my partner, my girlfriend now, and um, moving back here. And I guess it's a testament, you know, something I'm proud of, the fact that I was able to get through that four years and, um, you know, put my mind into something else, stay on track and just truly believe that I could, I could come back and um, train hard for that. And now I'm faced with, you know, I'm a month away from starting pre-season and it's exciting. And like I said, I'm, I'm proud of being able to get through that and, um, you know, what was probably the hardest time in my life. Yes. Mm. Yep. Some of them are really good on the bench press, but couldn't do 20 push-ups, for example. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, you know, lifting heavy is always a thing that the boys often want to do. And Christian, you made mention of, of when Sandor came down that in terms of his fundamentals of, of his conditioning, that yep. he said he, that you had to work on a bit of, a bit of stuff. I'm yep. interested to hear about your experiences at the Roosters and then coming across to, to Woodford's and mm. what was the difference. Yeah, I guess um, it was a big shock. You know, I thought I was ticking all the boxes, doing everything right. I'm not going to lie, when I was young, all I did was bodybuilding training. You know, I went, went in, some bicep curls. I was doing everything right. You know, I was doing my programming, but I was so focused on getting bigger, putting more muscle on. The fact is I was missing this, the main things that are going to help me with my training. If I, you know, I go to a place like Woodford, we didn't really have places for junior athletes to train when I was younger. So I'm excited to see guys at 14, 15 going in there and learning the basics and really the real techniques and what's going to help them. So if I was to say now, how would I train? I would focus on what's going to help me as a rugby league player. Now, when I was 16, uh, 17, when I was 17, actually, I had a knee reconstruction and um, you know, I was 69 kilos. And I, had, I, think, I think I had half a year off school, went to the gym and ended up being 83 kilos. So it obviously changed my life. Now there's a fact that you guys need to go through. You need to go through a process where you need to develop and athletes bigger, stronger, faster. It's definitely gonna help you. But start to think about, um, you know, speed being a fundamental thing that you need to work on. Being as powerful as you can and being strong, but relative to your sport. So start to think when I'm in the gym or when I'm on the field, how, what am I doing to make myself a better rugby league player? Now, is, is doing bench press, you know, three days a week or focusing just on that, is, how much is it going to really help you as a rugby league player? You know what I mean? How many, how many times are you on the floor and you're pushing people off you? It's a, it's a small, tiny part of the game. So start to think about whether it's in the gym, whether I'm focusing on a lift, whether I'm focusing on something from the coaches or I'm doing my speed work, 
how will it make me a Betty footy player? Because that's at, the, that's at the end of the day, your end goal. So that's what I would say is now my main focus. Everything I'm doing with training is related to me making me a better player. And that's becoming more powerful, becoming stronger and faster, but relative to my sport. And uh, yeah, when I came to Woodford, I had to tear that all down. I went back to the basics and you've got some awesome coaches here who preach those fundamentals, but understand that if you can get a grip on those, once you get into a system that's a little bit more advanced and you're a little bit older, you're going to be miles ahead than uh, just focusing on, you know, what every other kid focuses on in the gym and just trying to, just trying to put on size and work on your bench press or your, bi your bicep curls or things like that, you know what I mean? Yep. I just think that... Um if we go back to that question, I just think that what happens is, if I had a pen here or something, what, if you, this is a continuum here, and if this is like advanced, and this is a novice, which is a beginner who just starts, what happens is so many of these kids miss the boat when they come from novice to intermediate, and they want to get to the advanced stuff. Now, I want you to think about it this way. If you go from here to more advanced stuff, it gives you nowhere to go when you actually do improve your, your, what we call your training age. So you don't need to rush the process. Take your time. I mean, he could have told me when he came down and I first chatted to him, he could have said, no, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I don't need this guy. You know, why is he telling me that I have to squat with body weight with a band bottom up? You, now, you're in a system for, what, nine, nine, eight years. He could have turned around and said, I'm not doing this. I'm just going to go back to what I'm used to. But he left his ego at the door and said, hey, let's, let's do this right. Let's get this, lay the foundation. So from that, we've kind of built a base. If you look, I look at everything like an athlete having a base. You know, you can't build a, a house without foundations. The foundation is your base, and then we build up. So this, if this is his general prep, the house comes up. The, the, tip, the top point is that sport-specific stuff, which he's doing now, which he's got a lot of the um, more specific guys around him, which he's trying to work on, and then he goes back into an NRL program. So I want you guys to think right now is the most important time. This is where you get your free games when you're younger. Most of you guys are 16, 17, correct? Free games, you I mean, we don't have to, you know, I'm sure Chase has explained the importance of just not rushing a program, just laying the foundations in terms of your fundamental motor patterns, like your hinge, your squat, your split squat, your hip thrust, your, your bench press, your push up, your row, your over press and your chin, those six movements, my big six. So just stick to the foundations and don't rush it. And um, you'll watch him come back and just, um, you're at the point now where he doesn't need me, like he, he's well past it, but he still, he still will hit the foundations. But right now, he's doing a lot of specific stuff with his rugby, a lot of specific stuff. So, which is, you'll see him come back and, and do real well. It's just the thing that you're only missing now is, and, and as you said, it's like riding a bike. I've talked to you about it, is, is the training stuff. But for you, you've done it your whole life. So, it's like just riding a bike. Yes, um, Sandra, I think the thing for me, mate, watching you train, it's, it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. And I think um, from that point of view, the discipline and the adherence is worth far more than what you just do in the gym. Do you want to chat to the boys about like what, what a sort of average day looks like for you in terms of how you prepare yourself, um, your routine when you wake up? Like, you know, you've always got your gym bag packed when you get to the gym, you've got your towel, your drink bottle. Um, just what you find actually helps you to keep your routine going day to day? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, the reality is I, I can't wait to get back to the NRL system, obviously. Now I, I have a full-time job and I train to try and get back, so that's obviously tough. But same, similar thing for you. You guys have to go to school all day, you have to train, you have to eat right, so let's call it the same thing. I'm always trying to prepare for the next day in terms of like, I know what I want to eat. I know if yeah, little things, if I do have my bag pack, it all seems like minor things, but I'm ready to go, you know what I mean? I know, I know where I'm going to be, I know what I'm going to do, and I've got all my training stuff sorted. So. Typical day for me uh, at the moment is I wake up early. Um, yeah, I can dive into little things, nutrition as well. I always have a smoothie in the morning because I want to get up and go. But some, I, I really bulk it up, whether it's, uh, you know, I have a big protein shake full of oats, banana, berries, avocado. Just really bulk it up. Smoothies are a great way for uh, some of our guys who are trying to put on weight and, uh, you know, can't eat meal after meal. I'll have a smoothie. I'll go to work. I wake up at about five o'clock, go to work till... 8.30, 9 o'clock, and then uh, usually I'm out on the field doing my training. So usually I'll do a speed, speed session or a conditioning session. So I'll run the two, training by myself, which is uh, pretty tough. And it's definitely made me uh, realize how lucky I am to be tr training in a team environment. Um, then I'll head back to, I'll finish that with some food, go back to work, uh, run another couple of classes, and then I'll have lunch. And then I'll end up usually at Woodford um, for my gym work in the afternoon. So when I go there, I'm either doing, um, we do sort of a lower body or upper body split. So I'll go there, 
work hard, make sure I'm there, you know, 15, 20 minutes before and I can get all my activation stuff in, my foam rolling, so I'm ready to go. And I, that's, that's a box I tick every time, you know what I mean? Those are the little things that you can start to get lean in on and miss those. But all those little steps are the things that mean, you know, for the last 12 months, I haven't looked like having an injury. So, and I'm just... Touch on that point. I remember, I remember when you said to me, you and I talked about, there was a time where you kind of stopped. Uh, you didn't stop doing it, but you kind of took it for granted, that small stuff we talk about. So in terms of the movement prep, and you said to me, oh, I've kind of, you know, not stopped on it, but kind of forgot how important it was. And you think once you, you know, for you, I know it's ingrained in you how important that stuff is. So you guys know your SMR, your mobility activation stuff, Chase? They do that? That mean for you, you haven't looked like, I know you're not playing, but you haven't even looked like getting an injury and right now your, your body's bulletproof. I mean, that's been so important for you as a whole program touching on that stuff. It's all little things and I, I just, it's, it's, hard, it's hard because I know, I remember, I know being 16, 17, I've, I've heard people come up here and talk to me. And to be honest, I was like, that's great. I don't. I didn't really give a shit. Do you know what I mean? That's that's the reality. But I'm telling you now, like you guys, coming back to the my NRL return. You know, I've obviously had to do with a fair bit of clubs. You guys should all be aspiring to play for the Melbourne Storm. Like that club is next level. You know, I've played it a few now, and I've obviously been around and seen the system. That club is well above any other team in the NRL. You should all be aspiring to play there. I promise you that. And if you do, no one gives a shit about how good a try you scored, how fast you are how talented you are, I guarantee you, they do not care about that there. You know, I'm, that place is unbelievable from what I've seen from the outside in. What they care about is those little things, I promise you. If you are the hardest worker in the room, you will get respect. If you apply that now to your school, to, to how you even just treat the, treat any form of rugby league, treat the weekend team, the team, you know, your school team, treat it as if that is your ultimate goal. Because I promise you, if you give that the respect now, that you do when you want to make it to the NRL, you'll be worlds above anyone else in your position. So if you can start to focus on those little things, and they might not seem like the be all and end all, but if you tick all those little boxes and you are diligent every time, and you are the hardest worker every time you go into the gym or out on the field, I promise you it will pay off. That is the easiest, but the most important lesson I can give you. And I can guarantee I've seen it time and time again, that will get you to where you want to be. And that's not, that's not exactly the blueprint. This doesn't give you much to work with, it's very broad but focus on that. Can you be the hardest worker every time you go into the gym, every time you go onto the field? Every time you train, what the guys preach, train with intent, you know, out on the field, be, train, train with intent, train hard, push the boys, be, be an inspiration for the other guys. And if you can come together as a team, that's only gonna progress you all further. So that's the main lesson I can give. I mean, it's, it, seems, it seems cliche, but if you can do all those little things right, you've got to understand that that's, that's the stepping stone to, get, to being where you guys want to be. A real testament, I suppose, to Billy Slow's journey back, you know, almost career ending, I guess, and he was a long time out of footy, and then to come back, train really like, a little bit like yourself, I suppose, training on his own, and but he really busted his guts to get himself super right, and then comes back, plays for Queensland, wins a premiership, and now playing for Australia is a pretty amazing story. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I've just turned 28, but I still idolise these guys, and I and I now just been in Melbourne. Obviously, I'm just new here, but I start to hear stories and. You, set, you sort of, you put, you put a Billy Slater on a pedestal thinking this guy's just a freak, like he's just a gun athlete. Of course he's gonna be an awesome footy player, but the stories you start to hear, like these guys spend hours watching video of opposing teams. Like I'd never did that, do you know what I mean? They spend hours working on their game. Done a little bit of training with the Storm, just looking at different things, potentially maybe going there and just showing me what Billy Slater would do in a normal week. It's, it's shocking. And we don't really get that information or really understand how hard do these guys really train? But to see it, even I am shocked, you know what I mean? And I think, wow, like that's truly, yeah, start to understand to be that next level, it just doesn't happen. Like, yes, Billy Slater's talented, but for him to get where he wants to be and Cooper Cronk and all these guys, you hear the stories and you think, fuck, you know, that's, I'm, I'm nowhere near where I need to be. I, I need to take it up another notch. These guys are putting hours and hours and hours in to what they want to do. And they're, and they're the best in the world. So what excuse do we have? Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> if you guys are... Yeah, cool. Because I know what a lot of the boys think sometimes, but um, sometimes size is an issue for the boys. You know, yep. they, they get overawed sometimes by, you know, opposition, or they look at some big blokes. But, you know, if I come back to someone like Billy Slater or, I don't know, we were talking to Brett Kamali the other week, weren't we, or some of the other... I and mean, I know they're in key positions. They're actually not that, that big a bloke. Or, or Cam Smith, for example, the amount of tackles he makes per game. So... Mm. 
it just goes to show in terms of technique, tackle technique, all that sort of stuff. So it's not always about the biggest bloke on the park. Um, I don't know if you played that at that level. Maybe you shed some light to some of these other boys who, who are not necessarily massive units, but you know, it's not always about getting yeah. big. You can play at a top level without being, you know, a Nelson or, or someone like that. Yeah, and we got. Nelson is about seven foot. Now we're going. Th you're going through a tough time at sixteen to eighteen. <laughs> we're going through a tough time at sixteen to eighteen, where there's some big kids. Um, but I tell you that you know that doesn't last forever. You know what I mean? Once, once we hit once we hit nineteen twenty, it's all fair game. Everyone, if you know, look at the look at the wingers these days, everyone's the same size. But to get through this point, like Cam Smith's an amazing example. Like, if you look, if you walk past him, you would not know he's played a day of football in his life. He looks like just average Joe, normal bloke, hasn't touched a weight, but un, impossible to beat in a tackle. Like it's it's unbelievable. And you know they spend a lot of time in wrestling and their groundwork and stuff like that, but. You hear the stories, apparently he's just, you know, they say that say he's mong strong. He probably couldn't bench 40 kilos, but the guy can, like, when he tackles you, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, focusing, I would say play to your strengths. At, at 16 to 18, that's probably what I focus on. What am I good at? What's, uh, you know, maybe if I lacked a bit of size and I wasn't able to maybe carry the ball as well as others, well, I'd be the best defender on the field. No one would score on my wing, you know what I mean? If you start to think about what are my strengths and how can I play to that, if you're not the biggest guy in the world, that... That doesn't. What does that mean? You know, you quit and it's over. Start to focus on things that don't rely on strength and size. And there is. And then on the other side of that, if you do have a bit of strength and size, fo start to focus on that power and make sure you're able to lead the team in that way as well. So I guess it would be finding out what your strengths are at this age, um, when you know there are it, there is a bit of distance between the bigger guys and the smaller guys, and it is an advantage. But find out what your strengths are and really play and focus on them. Can I can I just add on to that what you just said? And we get that, this in football because we're AFL. Jay and I are both heavily AFL, not NRL. What you guys call football is not football, it's rugby. But anyway, that's minority. Yeah, league. But um, I think that it'd be just as bad in rugby as in football where you see kids with the same chronological age but biologically completely different. So you're always going to have that massive kid who's 15. And the reason why that 15-year-old belts everyone and wins those BNF is because he is bigger and stronger than all the kids. So my advice is, if you are a bigger, stronger kid, don't take that for granted, what Sandor said. Work harder on your skills because what we see in AFL is a lot of the kids that are just bigger, they don't really develop their skills because they're just like, well, I'm too good, I don't really need to do that. Where the other kids who are smaller have to work a lot harder, so they work on their game on that side. So kind of portraying to that question is, if you are a bigger kid, yeah, still work harder on your skills and understand there is more development to you. But if you are smaller than them, it's not the worst thing to happen. Because as Shandor said, there's going to come a point where it's going to catch up. You know, if you are bigger, make sure you still have those skills and you are working hard in the gym as well. You had a question? I played wing. Yes, yeah, so I played on the wing and uh, yeah, we'll see. I mean, depending on where I end up, I'll probably, wing centre is probably the position I go again. Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> If I go to Storm, mate, I won't be playing on the wing, I'll tell you that. Not with them boys. But the, the other thing with Harold Matson stuff too, I always, you know, I don't know, I have a bit of an emotional attachment with that stuff as well. Like, when I was, don't get me wrong, when, when you're 16, you're faced with Obama, it is the be-all and end-all. Right then, I, yes, I, I accept that. It's, it's the most important thing, but it means nothing, honestly. Right, when you, get, when you get to the face with 18, 19, 20, you're trying to play first grade, no one cares about if you made the Harold Matson team. That's the reality. If you don't make it, Use it as an opportunity to fuel you to motivate yourself to make the next team in 18s. You know what I mean? Take it, spin it as a positive. I'm not saying don't aspire to that, don't try and do that, but don't let it get you down to the point where it's a negative effect on your football. Because I, I, I remember those days, and it is a high-pressure environment. It's the same thing, obviously, as you, as you get older, but making all these teams thinking that if I don't make it, I'm never going to be anything, or I'm never going to make it as a rugby league player, it's rubbish, I, I promise you that. So try not to be disheartened, aspire to these things. They're a great accolade to make these teams, but if you don't, it's not the end of the world. And try not to, you know, that pressure, it's, it's not a good feeling and I, I don't wish that upon anyone, the, the, uh, the system to make it, it, it is hard, but just know that if you don't make those teams, I could, you could name a long list, hundreds of players that are now playing rugby league at the top level that didn't make the teams along the way, whether it be schoolboys, Harold Matz, SG Ball. So uh, yeah, that's an important one to What's remember Harold as well. Matt? They're just our teams we make, 16s, 18s, under 20s. Oh, so, yeah. Potentially some of these boys can play in that next season. What's, just, what's the percentage of kids um, who make it, like from 
uh, you go in the twenties and you go into what's the percentage that make it from there? I don't know, probably very low, but like low. Yeah, like I said, I, w I wouldn't give that speech. Like uh, maybe it's good, maybe it's good for you to hear that. But I, when I got told a million times, you know, I, you're genuinely in a room. Maybe you guys haven't experienced it yet. But when I was in Sydney, for example, there's kids that are on 40, 50 grand when I was 17, you know, from Queensland. Of course, when they're saying one or two of you are going to make it, they're not talking to me. But I just thought, mate, you, some recruitment officer at a club is not going to tell me whether I'm going to make it. That's the reality. So I'm, I, you're going to get all those speeches about how hard it's going to be. And I, and I accept that it is hard, but that's not what you're going to focus on. You're going to focus on the fact that you're going to make it and you're going to do whatever it's going to take to make it. So... Just when you have those conversations and you hear these things and you think, this is a bit of a negative, bit of a downer, it's not what I want to hear, just take it as fuel to the fire and say, yeah, that's great, but I'm going to prove you wrong. That's, that's the mentality you want to have. Jake. Um, Sam, I reckon for these kids as well, um, just touch on briefly maybe about, obviously, rugby as a sport, very New South Wales and Queensland centric. Mm. Um, but the Storm obviously plays a premium on you know, the cultures paramount in terms of what makes them successful and leave the organisation a better place than when you found it. And I think for you for you guys playing down here, you know, you've had some really good games against Patrician Brothers, um, Illawarra Sports High and that sort of stuff. And what makes you successful is not what makes them successful is a rugby league heartland. You know, lots of kids to pick from, um, you know, all those facilities out there, that sort of stuff. But as a as a school you guys compete well above your you know well above your weight grade down here. Um, and I think that's a lot to do with the culture as well. So you maybe talk about how Melbourne Storm focus a lot more on um, not just rugby, but just the culture and the standards around the place that they accept. So obviously the idea is that we get more kids to the school who want to play rugby and represent how long is the school. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity. I mean, you talk a couple of those schools I played growing up, Matr Patrician Brothers, Illawarra, uh, Endeavour, Kibra, all these schools, they're great schools. And like you said, they got hundreds of kids to choose from that all play rugby league. But as a Melbourne, you know, obviously not a rugby league dominant place, I would say that's what Melbourne Storm, that's why they're so successful. Down in Melbourne, obviously they don't get the attention, but they all come together as a team and they, they pride themselves on that. If you play Melbourne in Melbourne, you know what to expect. You know what's coming. You know, I, I think that'd be something to aspire to when these teams, Patricia Brothers, whatever you want to call them, when they play Hallam, they know what they're going to get. They know they're going to get a team that's hungry for Victoria, all trying to make it, and they've come together, and you guys are going to back each other on the field. That's the type of culture. That's the stuff that gets me excited, you know what I mean? So that's what I would try and turn this place into. You want to pride yourself on the fact that anytime any team knows they're coming to play, I think Coach said there's only two Victorian teams in the school system who are really having a crack. Is that right? Yeah. So, you know, take, take pride in that. Come together as a team and understand that Let's put it on these guys. Let's put it on these New South Wales and Queensland teams. Have each other's back and play with some pride. That's something that they can't, they, they won't have. They can't replicate that, you know what I mean? That culture, that understanding. It's tougher for you guys down here. That's the reality. But use that as fuel to come together because they're going to take that for granted. They're going to come down. Maybe they think, maybe they, they find Victoria is an easier game. But you guys need to start to change that perception. So I think if you guys can come together, whether you're playing up there down here and every time they play a Victorian team, it's going to be tough. And you guys can start to build around that and create that culture. And that's, uh, that's the sort of things you guys are playing for. I think it's something worth focusing on because, uh, like I said, that motivation, those other teams don't have. So you guys are lucky in that respect. Well, uh, probably a, more a question for you, Christian and Jay, just about your experiences in the American college system. So as you yeah. mentioned before, Izzy's got some aspirations made to go across to the States. Um, and we know, you know conditioning is a real big part of, of American college football, isn't it? So, Maybe for those who, who don't play rugby league, maybe that's a pathway as a conditioning coach or, I don't know, something like what you guys do. For me, I, I think the thing that you boys, and like Sam said, I'm not going to sugarcoat it, what will shock you is the standards of what they accept are a premium. So, for example, NC State, we locked the doors of the gym 10 minutes before the session started. And if you weren't in the gym and you missed three sessions for your, your four years of college, they spent four years there, if you miss three sessions in that four years, your scholarship's terminated. So they can strike each time they miss. And you know, there's lots of other reasons, like you know, um, doing drugs, going to parties, all that sort of stuff that's um, inherently linked to being at college. What's expected of those guys is in four years, you don't miss more than three gym sessions by 10 minutes before that starts. So if you start the session at 10 o'clock in the gym, and it wasn't 10 o'clock, it was actually like 6 a.m., you know, it was, it was early. If you start at 6 a.m., the doors of the gym shut at 5:50 a.m. So that they, they call it pack time. And if you if you think about the commitments required to that, 
to be at every single gym session at 5.49 or earlier before he's in college career, that's, that's what fuels those guys. And the reality is in America, um, you know, school and uh, university is, it's a, it's a real privilege, it's not a right, if we were to go to university in Australia, you know, you study hard at school and you get your grades and you can get government funding. If you want to go to school in America, you need to be incredibly rich, incredibly smart, or a great athlete, or a combination of. So those kids who get in, it's a real, it's a real um, privilege to them and, and they treat it as such. Um, so you know, Matthew, I was having a bit of a laugh with your, um, with your little era before, mate, wherever you are, but, but they, um, they, they've, got, they've got rules, it's like, you know, no, no chains, no diamonds, um, ears and that sort of stuff. Because for them, it's not about ego. So they sort of think if you're rocking up to the gym session with this brand new gold chain or um, this new, new start in your ear, that takes the attention away from why they're there. They're there to work out hard. You know, they never listen to the coach and have the respect to the coaches there. And that's far more important to them than how strong you are. So for example, like the University of Miami, which some of you guys might, might know them, they're a pretty, pretty big university in America. They suspended 13 players this year. Right, because they went to a party during the pre-season when they were told not to. Right, so 13 players out of the squad of 53 that actually made the team didn't matter. You know, starting quarterbacks, starting linebackers, <coughs> you know, gone. So NFL recruits are rocking up to watch games and they just say you're not playing. And it's far more important than that. And not just that, they have, they have um, requirements for GPA, which is your grades. So what's the most exciting part about rugby for you guys? What do you like most about everything you do? The, the game. Am I right to say the game? Yeah. Right? So the only way they can get hurt is by saying you're not playing the game. And it's, it's a different environment over there. So I mean, they play 12 games a year, four years. So if you're incredibly lucky, you play 48 games, but the reality is you might only play 20 games because there's obviously a lot of older guys in front of you. So to miss those games through a lack of discipline is something that really hits those guys pretty hard. So for me, I've like, taken away the, um, the bells and whistles, which is the big, strong athletes, the powerful guys and that sort of stuff. The expectations and standards are pretty phenomenal over there. And it's, you know, getting your school work done. If, if, the, if the lecturer or the professor says, hey, um, you know, Izzy, you didn't, Izzy didn't hand this assignment, then they send a report to the head coach, and you might think it's funny. They send a report to the head coach, and the head coach goes, you're not playing. And, you know, these guys playing in front of 70, 80,000 people at 19, 20 years old, and they don't play because they didn't get the homework in on time. And that's literally, that's literally what happens, and I think, um, just go up with Sam, I said before, if you guys take the same approach and the game is what means the most to you, you've got to give yourself every opportunity to play the game. Um, and it might mean doing your phone rolling. Um, you know, it might mean when um, Trav and Jamie say, guys, we're going to do extra conditioning today. Or you know, it might be something as simple as you go and pick up rubbish in the schoolyard. Because right? who knows what the All Blacks are most famous for? What's the number one thing the All Blacks are most famous for out of everything? Obviously. You know, heaps of Gladys Lake Cubs, dominant team on the field, but what are they most well known for? Does anyone know? They clean up their own mess. Yeah. So, you know, you've got all these, all these amazing athletes. It's going for everywhere at the moment, isn't it? Like, that, that's right. You saw the footage yeah. of JT a few rounds ago. Yeah, per, perfect example. Um, as opposed to guys, you guys might have seen, but Brendan Goddard who plays AFL, he walked in at half time and grabbed his teammates, he whacked over all the lollies and cups of Gatorade, and his teammates are going, what are you doing? and just walked up to other people to pick it up, whereas all blacks are known for you know, cleaning up their own mess, they've got a no dickhead policy. Um, and they don't shy away from it, they actually call it the no dickhead policy. It means if you're a dickhead, we don't want you in the team. And if you guys get to the point as a, as a school and a program, where you don't want dickheads in your program, you know, that's a really strong point, so it means that you guys, you guys drive the standards. And the players do in America, um, like they have the coaches barking at them, but ultimately, the older guys, they say to the younger guys, no, you need to be here at 10, 10, like 10 to um, 6 in the morning. If they miss sessions, their teammates go pick them up in their cars to make sure they don't miss the next one. Um, you know, and it's a really powerful part of what generates the, the really good programs. It was, it's what separates them from the not, um, not so good programs. So, is, is everyone seen Last Chance You? Yep. Yep. So, you, you guys know what it's about. Like, you know, there's a lot of discipline required in what, what gets into game day. It's not just a right that you. You go to train and you play, you know, you have to earn the right to play and then when you do, they, they take that with every chance they get. And that's the thing that I took most out of my time over there as well. Woody, Woody might be different, he went to different schools, he might have chat about what they were like. I just think that, I think the one thing I learned from it was just the fact that, I mean, when I went there, I'd never seen a program like that. Like, you hear about stuff like that and just the discipline they have over there, the understanding of athletic development is just ridiculous. Like, it changed my life. Like, literally, I'm, I'm sitting here only because of that. Like. 
I was a kid when I went there, never went overseas. I was 23 when I went over there. That was the first time overseas. And just to see the discipline, the understanding of like how hard they have to work to get to that level was just, I was just taken back. And I said, what, the, what, what are we doing in Australia? What, what, what the hell is this? Like we're so far behind the eight ball. And that's where I came up with the idea about Woodford. And I said, I'm gonna be the guy to drive this forward. I'm gonna be that figurehead, regardless if people like me or not. I'm going to do it. I'm going to throw my heart into it because as Chandor talks about, he's having a passion and really loving something and throwing your heart into it. And that's what I did with Woodford. I just threw my heart into it. And regardless if it failed or not, I didn't really care at the time. I never even thought about it failing because I loved, that was my love. What I, what I still do today, it's my passion. And there's some days like what Chandor, it's funny, Chandor, I can understand what he's saying in his career. It's like so up and down. It's the same for my business as well. It's like, I was talking with Jay and Alex say on the way here, it's just so up and down, but Adversity can either cause you to stop and give up, but what, what am I gonna do that? I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna keep moving forward, like what Chandler did in his career. So I can see parallels and you just gotta keep moving forward, regardless if it's football or if it's your job. You can take a lot out of the, this talk because it's, he's, he's not just talking about his sport, he's talking about his life in general. And I can relate to that because my life, the last five years has been just like this, high, low, high, low. And it's like every time I have a down point in my career, I don't sit back and sit in a corner like what well, Chandler, exactly what Chandler said. He could have sat back and taken the easy route and said, oh, my life's so hard and blamed everyone else. But Chandler said, no, I'm going to learn something from it. And I think I've taken a lot from his story. But every time I've had a low in my career, someone said, oh, you know, you're not good enough. There's no um, industry in Australia to do this. Everyone's tried. You can't, you're going to fail. Every time someone said that to me, I said, who the fuck are you to tell me I'm not good enough to make this happen? And I, I just kept moving forward with it. And... I think I look back at my days, I've been to America three times now since I've gone, uh, and I had my stint at Maryland. Every time I looked at that, I thought to myself, how hard, uh, what I went back to the drawing board was, every time I worked hard, something good came out of it. And every time I took my foot off the pedal and said, hey, I don't need to work this hard, something bad happened. So you can kind of work out how, how important is work ethic to have. I think, I think just for that, Christian, is that you guys need to decide what standards you drive. So it's not up to um, uh, Trav and Jamie to say, these are the standards that we're going to have. Because you guys all know what's, expect what's expected of your school, right? You know what you can and what you can't do. But you, know, you guys can decide how you approach your time in the gym, and that's going to reflect how you play. So for example, it might mean that you older guys, you know, going through year 11, year 12, who are the, you know, the face of the rugby program this year and next year, you guys decide that every single person in the gym is in the same uniform. Because what does that reflect? Discipline. It reflects discipline, that's absolutely, Brooks, that's, that's right. It reflects discipline and it reflects the fact that no one's better than the other person next to them and everyone's on the same page and we're working towards the same goal. It might mean when the, when the weight session, when you finish your weight session, you know, Jace doesn't walk around packing up plates that weren't there. It might mean that you guys decide that what we stand for is we pack the weights up because we respect the fact that Jace has come here to run the class, we respect the fact that the school's put good facilities in place. You guys do have good facilities here. So if you guys respect the fact that the school put that in place for you, maybe the way you can pay that back is putting all the weights away in the right order. Um, and as I said, there, there are a couple of suggestions which you, that I've got for you guys, but it's totally up to you what you want to do with it. But I think when you have those sort of rules and um, like you said, what's the discipline of gear, no one else decides that except you. So you know, it's not up to teach, it's not up to Jace, it's up to you guys to decide it. And what might be a good idea if you guys, if you guys really want to push hard next year and take that next step, get together without the teachers and say, hey, this is what we're going to do. And first, first day back in pre-season, you can say, okay, um, Mr. Fardell, this is what we stand for. We are going to pack our weights up perfect every single time. We are going to wear the same uniform every single time. We are all going to bring a drink bottle to our session. We're all going to be at training 10 minutes early or five minutes early. doesn't matter what it is. But as soon as you guys take ownership of that, it's out of, it's out of our control and you guys drive that yourself. I think that's where... Um, you know, Christian had to do that. Christian obviously went overseas last week. He left the gym to the staff and his expectations as well. So that, that would be my advice for you guys is to take ownership of it and whatever you decide you want to stand for, stand for it. You know, it might, it might lead me to score a try. Every single person comes in the same group and you know, you know, high fives or whatever it is. But that stuff's really important. I think that it's far more important than the skills and the, the weights, but that's meant to hold you pretty good steady. And I think that what, what you said hit now and I think that the biggest thing in the All Blacks obviously that's incredible the fact that they clean up their own mess I think that's awesome because 
it's those little things that count and they all add up. And that's one thing I'm starting to understand about business, but the most successful sporting teams, and you look at, I know you, I don't know if you guys follow AFL, but if you follow Richmond, and Richmond came from getting belted in the last round of the last season to win the premiership, and what it really came down to for them was just literally their culture. They changed the culture within a year. It's possible to do. It takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of you guys to take responsibility for each and every one of you to pull up your mates on, your peers on. But if, if you do do it, and that's something even in our Woodford workplace, which we're working on, is a cultural thing. Regardless if I'm not there or Jay's not there or my old man's not there or someone else not there, we all stand up. It should, you've got to take ownership. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've learned is because everyone knows... You know, if most most guys, and it, it, regardless, it will be in the same in AFL as in for rugby league. You've got every club's going to have good coaches. Let's be serious, but it's that one percenter. Those those one percent is either in a sporting team or a work environment that's going to really add up and make you guys better as a team and, and to bring you up as a team environment. And I think that's one thing I'm learning is um, culture, and that's the biggest thing that I, I realise is having that right culture where you can manifest and improve your performance or improve whatever it is, if it's your career or sport, is to have that that want and will to get better. And I think that you can take a lot out of both what I've said, Jay said, um, in terms of just improving yourself, regardless if it's in your schooling or in your, what you guys call football, I call rugby, and your football is to get better and just ha have that, um, that want and desire to do it. Don't accept mediocrity. That's my biggest thing I can leave you with. I, I can't, personally, I can't stand mediocrity. I'm always looking to get better as an individual, regardless of what it, what it is. And I know Shandall's the same, the best, the best, whatever they do, they always want to get better. So um, always ask questions. Don't ever feel like you, it's a dumb question because trust me, I've asked as many dumb questions as you guys have had. So ask questions, want to get better in each and every aspect of your life and um, just want to improve. Any more questions? Yes. Athletes? Yeah. yeah. Um, look, it's an open-ended question because how many times, and you got to realise I'm in the private sector, it's completely different to pro sport where they're actually getting paid um, full-time. Um, so Shandor, you know, you got to realise he's had to um, train full-time and work full-time. So it, it's a bit different. So I think he's going to really respect the system a lot more than once you did when you were 22. Um, so for me, it really depends on how many times they can train. What are their goals? Are they in-season, off-season or pre-season? Um, and then I'll structure a program to suit their needs um, and also their previous injury history as well. Um, so it's very wide open. Um, if you look at Chandor's case, for example, he's doing a lot of work at the moment, but that's not a bad thing because what they're trying to do is um, build is what we call his training load up. So when he gets to pre-season, he's going to be good to go. Um, so at the moment, I'm just going to talk about what I'm doing with him. Um, he actually is doing... Uh, you're doing two speed sessions a week and two conditioning at the moment, correct? I, I'm not, I don't program for that. That's the stuff that he's got from other guys. But with him, we do four gym sessions a week. We split it to two lower body, two upper body. So it's fair, it's fair frequency. Once he goes to, um, to uh, whichever club he's going to go to, um, he'll be going, I'm pretty sure they're going to do similar to what I'm doing. They're going to go two upper, two lower. Once he gets the pre-season, they might cut the upper body down to one because it will get more specific and focus on skills. Um, and then in season, they might do two full bodies. That's what I'm guessing. Um, because in season, the main focus is recovery, training and games. And everything else is secondary. Um, so that mainly is structure. So what you want to think, it starts high volume, low intensity. What I mean by that, it's, it's going to be more of a, a general prep focus. And as we get close to season, Intensity is going to increase, so we're going to focus more on strength, power, speed work and get more specific with our training as we get close to the season. And I, I think, um, Brooks, a really good way to look at it, mate. Um, who's going to do quick maths in the room? How many hours in a week are there? A lot. A lot? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Alright, so if you've got, you got 168 hours in a week, guys, alright? So 7 by 24, 168. So I want you to think about how many, how many hours a week do you guys train on average here Skills, gym, everything. In season or? Yeah, in season. Mm -hmm. You probably do maybe one eight to ten total. Uh, so that's probably, let, let's, say there's, let's say there's eight hours of training a week. There's four days, train two hours a day, right? There's 160 hours that you're not training. 
So what's going to have a bigger impact on how you perform? The 8 hours or the 160 hours? The 160 is going to have far more impact than the 8. Right? And just say, for example, you train, you can train 5 hours a day right, for 7 days a week. That's 35 hours. But it still leaves 133 hours that you're not training. So what I want you all to consider is the fact that what, what makes Sandal successful is first of all his mindset, um, his discipline, all those things we spoke about. But, you know, to sleep, you know, up at four, what, 5 o'clock every day. Mm. Right? So to be up at 5 o'clock every day, he's got to go to bed at the same time every night to make sure he's getting enough sleep. You know, to make sure he builds muscle, he's got to eat, what, 3,500 calories a day, 4,000 a day. 5,000. Right? So that, 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 takes, that takes commitment. So if he doesn't plan for that, and he misses his smoothie in the morning, right? The smoothie might be worth, say, 800 calories, which means he's got to find ways to get that back in during the day. All right. So all those little things, all those little decisions you make about tra the training is really important, man. It's a great question to ask. I just want to make sure you guys understand that uh, it's the sleep, it's the foam rolling, it's the stretching at home. You know, it might be some ice baths, uh, it might be some meditation or yoga, whatever you guys like to do away from away from school. But that's going to have a lot more impact on how you perform than the hours you spend training. Because the reality is you spend more time not training than you do training. And even less playing. How long does a game take? 90 minutes? Right, eight, sorry, 80 minutes? 80 minutes for 18 games a year. Versus all that hours of training, all that time trying to recover. That's where the important needs to be. That's where you need to spend your time as well. So if you train if you train for three hours a day, then go home and sit on PlayStation and Facebook and Instagram till you know, midnight, and try and get up at seven o'clock to come to school and you're tired, you might as well not train at all because you're too tired the next day to go to school and get your classes done. If you don't get your homework done and don't hand in your reports that we spoke about before, you might not be allowed to train. So all that hard work you're doing can be undone just by some simple decisions that you chose not to make. We'll go one more question. Yeah. I, I sometimes see, and it's probably from the boys that want to work that little bit harder, yep. and I see a detrimental kind of effect, and yep. it, it comes down to we do a session with Jace or Jay, and in their mindset, I didn't get my shoulders done today. So yep. I'm, I'm going to go and lift a little bit more. Yep. What's the negative effect of yep. too much training sometimes? Okay, so that's a good question. So in this industry, especially, we think more is better. Uh, it's always funny when you get the kids down, and I, I'm a very fundamentalist in training. So they might do three, four movements, and they're like, "Oh, I don't feel tired. I don't feel I got my heart rate up." And well, it's, we, get that, we get that opinion with. Yeah. I think they don't do the RDLs like we tell them to, yep. but if they had their own choice, yeah. that wouldn't be a thing that they would do. Correct, because it's all mirror mentality yeah. because they're young. And, and I get that because when I was 16, I used to always think, you know, I want to get big, I want the girls to look, you know what I mean? I, yeah. I, you know, I, understand, I can understand where they're coming from, but as Shandor said, you've got to start thinking, how can I, what am I doing this for? What am I, everything should be geared towards how am I prove myself as an athlete, as a rugby league player? Not, oh, how, how jacked up can I get my arms, you know? And that, you know what's funny? If you train like an athlete, you're gonna end up looking like him. I mean, have a look at him. Obviously, genetics are important, but if you do your compound movements, you squat, you deadlift, you bench, you row, you're gonna look, you're gonna grow mass anyway, because they're big compound movements. But I think the big issue is, and it stems through the fitness industry where it's like, if you, if you look at someone who's a real big, big, big guy compared to someone like a, um, a Cameron Smith, you're probably gonna turn around and say, well, that, that big jack guy is a lot more athletic than Cameron Smith, but we all know Cameron Smith is a bull. As he said, he's hard, you know, he tackles very well, he's very hard to tackle, and that's because he's functionally strong, because when he's in the gym, he does the appropriate work. And that's the biggest thing to start understanding is more is not better. And you have gotta stop, I think the biggest thing is you have gotta stop looking at this, I'll give you an example, it's like a speed-based session. So if you're doing an acceleration-based session, and you might see someone who sprints for 10 meters, which is great, that is acceleration, zero to 20, right, sprints for 10. But what they do wrong is they don't allow enough rest and recovery to give another maximum effort. So what they do is they turn to a conditioning session, okay? Speed work, you should be just as fresh at the end like you are at the start. It's all about maximum effort, it's about techniques, it's about neural patterning. But that's where we as an industry, we have to educate the junior, next junior batch of athletes and say it's not about fatigue for strength, power and speed, it's not about getting your heart rate up. Because a lot of the kids, and I'm sure Jamie, exactly what they say is, oh, I'm not tired. I don't feel like I've got anything out of it. It's about stimulation, not annihilation. So we just explain and educate. It's about stimulating your nervous system, but it's not about that conditioning effect we're trying to get. We're trying to get that velocity response. We're trying to get that patterning response. It's not about getting tired. So if I can um, educate you kids on anything is everything, and Shandor touched on it, is everything you do 
One thing I just want to quickly touch on is, because um, I have done these talks before, is um, don't worry about all that bullshit supplements. Just look at, look at eating right. You know, as Shandor talked about, you know, um, start understanding the importance of carbohydrate and protein and fat in your diet. I'm not going to touch on it too much because I'm not a dietitian. But I think it's very important at a young age you get your proper nutri nutrients in because that's going to fuel your body. And at a young age, I was an idiot. I used to throw, and I'm not going to lie to you, I used to throw a lot of money away on supplements because I used to read, when I was 15, I um, used to work at a sporting goods source called Sportsmart. I used to print off all the bodybuilding pages put around my room. And um, I used to go out and buy all the supplements and all the, you know, the new things that came out. And in reality, they're just throwing money down the drain. If I, if I could look back at myself and give myself some... Um, vital information, knowledge, and um, I'll just say, don't worry about that. Just learn about eating right, understanding the fundamental movements and developing as an athlete, because I used to play football and I used to always be like, okay, well, if I'm bigger, I'm gonna play better. But in reality, it was just kind of doing the wrong things and I had to just learn the, as much as possible the basics. Because you've got too many young kids these days focusing on the stuff they shouldn't really be focusing on, the stuff that exactly you talked about. Beautiful. Awesome.